Hello, and welcome to another episode of Two Average Joes. I'm Joseph St. John. I have about 30 years worth of law enforcement, and we're here to continue to talk about the Michigan murders that occurred in the late 60s in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Most of them occurred. And I'm known as the co-ed murders, but as you'll see today, that's probably not an app name for it. And my partner here, Robert, I'll let you finish up on that. Yeah, Robert Baker. I'm a trial attorney in, in uh, Southwest Michigan, have been for about 25 years, do a lot of criminal law and uh, other litigation. So today we're going to talk about the next victim. And anybody that's listened to this and heard me talk about Don Basin at all, um, this is a big changer for me. This is a game changer. I see this as a completely kind of different situation. And Don is um, 13. And that's a big difference. And she's not a co-ed. And to be honest with you, she is walking railroad tracks, if I'm not mistaken. And she is not looking for a ride. Okay, and there's been some speculation that she coulda, shoulda, woulda, but there's no proof of that. Okay, unlike the other ones where there is just an absolute guarantee they were looking for a ride. Um, I think when we get to talk about the girl in California, there's some differentials too. But for right now, coming up on Dawn, She's not looking for a ride that we know of. And she is, from what I understand, about 150 yards, not miles, about 150 yards from her house. She could see it. So, Robert, you had this some search on there and got a little information. Tell me what you got. Uh, Dawn Basom, I believe she was a uh, eighth grader. Um, she was... Um, on, last seen on April 15th, 1969, which is we're just a couple of days away from what her um, would be her anniversary of her death. Uh, it is uh, she was went to go see her boyfriend at the time who was 18 years old. His name was Earl. According to uh, Earl James's book, Earl says that uh, they were just friends and the he never even tried to kiss her, let alone have sex with her. I'm a little suspect of that. <clears throat> she was seen by two friends down by the Huron River, and uh, she sat and talked to them. They were fishing, and uh, she talked to them for about 15 minutes. It started to get dark, and uh, she asked them if uh, she wanted if they would walk her home. They said, no, we live in the opposite direction. She walked on along the railroad tracks towards her home about two miles away. Uh, it was just getting a little bit dark. Uh, a guy who was a 31-year-old railroad buff saw Dawn um, and identified her. She was wearing an orange sweater, and she had just dyed her hair. Uh, I think it was strawberry blonde. So she was pretty distinctive. She was a pretty girl. Uh, looked, they say old, older for her age, but her face in the pictures that we found she still looks like a child, 13-year-old child. Yeah, she looks 13 to me. Yeah, she's really athletic, supposedly, so her body may be more, more uh, adult developed. <clears throat> she was walking uh, when this railroad buff saw her walking um, down the railroad tracks in a rapid pace. Um, she got down the road, uh, and I guess a cook threw a menu at the dude, and so he quit looking at her. There was a 75-year-old that had seen her. I believe that's the last known person to see her. He was, she was walking fast towards her home. Um, he knew her, so he knew who it was. And uh, to see anyone else walking in the area was not unusual. Um, the interesting thing is, okay, so she, that's the kind of the last time she was seen. And um, she was somewhere close to 150 yards from her house. Um, she uh, disappears and then her body was found about at daybreak the next day. Okay. So daybreak, at least according to, uh, I think it was Michigan murder book was about five, five fifty ish. So somewhere between six and seven would have been when the body was found. So she would have been dead at that time. Depending, they couldn't determine her uh, the time of her death, uh, but she was last seen seven thirty to eight o'clock at night. The uh, the really interesting thing, and 
Joe, we could talk about this is uh, there was a, a maroon car with three guys in it. That was, uh, yes. Um, there's, uh, at, at about seven 30, a neighbor was going to another neighbor's house to order some pizza. And, uh, as she walked, she saw uh, a red or maroon 1963 Chevrolet. She observed a girl sitting close to the driver. Um, she was wearing a lighter white colored blouse. Uh, Miss Basin was wearing a white blouse yeah. at the time. Was she wearing a white blouse? She was, but she was, uh, it must have been under the orange sweater. She was wearing yeah. orange. Motorcycle. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, there was a second vehicle also parked there, and that was a, a blue Beetle type Volkswagen, darker, light blue. There's con uh, conflicting testimony on that. And two young men were sitting in that between to be 23 and 25 years old. So, Joe and I have talked about it. We are, our working hypothesis has been either John Norman Collins killed all of these women, um, either individually or with other people. Could have been Gary Leiterman, could have been some unknown suspect or suspect. Right. So that's kind of our working hypothesis. We have not committed, though we <laughs> strongly suspect. And we have a strong suspicion. <laughs> The, the, the problem that I have in going back into what he's saying, that there's somebody that actually saw two cars, mm -hmm. two different people in it. Yes, Don is wearing a white blouse, but it is underneath an orange sweater. Let me get for people that don't live in Michigan. It's April 15th in Michigan. It's probably still a little chilly. Uh, it's April 17th right now, and it was 30 degrees yesterday, and I suspect I haven't been out yet today, but I suspect it's 30 degrees. Yeah, so you have that. Here's been my stumper all the time with all of these cases, and it's why we have tried very hard to keep an open mind about everything, okay? I think we are now, I mean, unless you just want to discard this witness who has no reason to go out here and lie, and she seems to be credible right? You have two cars. You have a series of people. Okay. The, you go back to the second homicide with Shell, Shell, right? She gets in a car with three people. Okay. Red Chevrolet with a black top. Yeah. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? Because that just is what you described, right? <laughs> right. Um, you have all of this and it starts to make me go, okay, you know, is it a stretch to go? There's other people. We knew he was a fratty. Long after he was out of his frat, he still ran with people that were in a frat with him. He was a very, I don't want to use the term that he was needy for his buddies, but his buddies were very, very important to him. They were part of a clique, for no better terminology. They were all little criminals. Yeah, they were robbing houses or uh, burgling houses together. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, you know, going and helping and planning and, you know, defrauding people to get a trailer to go to California to perhaps murder some people, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there, there is this inner circle, and that was the word I was looking for, because that's better than click. Click has a little bit of, you know, that's kind of mm -hmm. not a good term anymore. It's, a, it's overused, but. He had an inner circle. And I think the inner circle thing is a big deal. And I, and I, so when you look at his life, you go, okay, this guy does have an inner circle. He has a gang of guys or group of guys that he runs with. And now we're back into Don and you're back in the basin and you're back into, there was other people in the car. And maybe that is Don in the car. Maybe they, they found a way to convince her. Maybe she felt safe because she thought it was one guy getting them. Again, we're speculating, but I mean, that's what you're left with right now. But I think we need to talk about some other things about Dawn. Um, one, she's 13. And depending on what you read, you can see her as being that she could have been confused for being older. We're going to have a photo that comes up later showing her with a more mature hairdo than you would have had otherwise. But even with that, I feel that um, she still has a very childish face. 
her other picture, she does appear to, uh, to be childish looking. Okay. Um, but there is one thing that is consistent through everything we've read. And you've, you've got the um, Catching Serial Killer book. And um, she is athletic. She is a person that would wrestle with her brother in the front yard. She got in a fight in school, got suspended. And apparently in this fight, somebody said something about something. They attacked Don and Don took care of business to the mm -hmm. point that everybody got suspended. And it was pretty much known around the school that, you know, she opened a can of, you know, what on this person mm -hmm. is the aggressor. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's been said, and I, and I think we, you get to read so much of it, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, where you heard this and heard that, and that's why we have our pre-meeting. But that seemed to have been a consistent, that, that there was even people that went as far as saying, I don't know if one guy could have caught her. Yeah. You know, she was athletic, she fought, she, she ran, she could do some things. She was not going to be passive about it, even though she was 13. But if you add extra people to it, you add an element of surprise, somebody jumping out somewhere, you know, there's a whole different element for that. But I think in Don's situation, whatever happens there, and I think, Robert, you probably got the best grip on this. Explain to you, explain to our listeners where this happened, mm -hmm. where it went, where she's found, Right. And then we'll build on to the weirdness that was around. Okay. So she lived on LaForge Road. Um, we should right. have a map up at this time, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll have a map up on, on this. It's, and it's right close to Huron Heights Apartments. And this was where a bunch of EMU students lived. And actually, John Norman Collins dated a gal from that uh, apartment mm -hmm. complex. And her house was supposedly across the street from that. And she lived at uh, 1312 LaForge Road in Ypsilanti. Uh, she was seen 150 yards from that. That was the last time she was seen. So she was abducted between that 150 yards. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, she was found on Gale Road, which was about a nine minute drive directly. And then the police, uh, about 11 o'clock on the 16th, found uh, her an orange mohair sweater behind an old deserted farmhouse at 1888 LaForge Road. And they believe that that, that was where she was killed. Okay, so uh, there was glass found in the basement. And in the bottoms of her shoes, glass sh uh, shards was found on the bottom of her shoes that matched that in the basement. Um, there was also, uh, let's see, it said that she was probably forced down in a cold, ba dark basement and she was murdered either in the basement or the barn. Okay. So you have within about, I don't know, a, a not very far drive. You have, uh, maybe a mile up the road from where she was abducted, she, she was killed. And mm -hmm. then a couple, uh, another couple, two or three miles away was where her body was found. And uh, we will have that picture up and you'll see more of, of, of how close proximity this was. Uh, the interesting thing was, was they did find her shoes. And this is what we had mentioned in another episode. And the shoes were found, um, close to where her body was found on two sides of the road. Mm -hmm. and, uh, depending on which book you read, one of them says it's uh, the same perpetrator throwing it out one side of the, of the car and then coming back the other way. Um, throwing it out the other side. Throwing the other side out. But her, her hands and her feet were dirty, which kind of allude to her having her shoes off. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether... Uh, James's book says that he believes, or at least the, the, the powers that be, the police believed that she was in rigor, which means that her body was stiff mm -hmm. from where the uh, killing occurred and that they took the body in rigor to, to the drop-off site. 
they couldn't determine the time of death because she hadn't eaten anything. And it was 53 degrees outside. So the body temperature had dropped down to the point where they could determine when her actual time of death was. So we have three, three sites. And I believe this is one of the few, the proud and brave that there are all three that are known the place where she was abducted from at least 150 yards from, Mm -hmm. and then where uh, the murder occurred, which was a mile or mile and a half away. And then the drop site. So that's this, that's what, when we were talking about the pre-show, I'm like, man, why wasn't this one solved? Because we have a red car with three guys in it. Right. Murder. And guess who was involved? Yes. Yes. Same name kind of keeps coming up. Also an interesting thing, and I think Robert, you can you can address on this. They find the crime scene, they do search it, but something interesting happens to the crime scene. A couple of interesting things. Okay, so this is this is what I wanted to talk to you about. Is okay, so a day or two after there's a, a guy goes, one of the detectives go back to the site and they find an earring that wasn't found the first time. Mm-hmm. And then they found um part of her blouse there that was cut and stuffed in her mouth. And that wasn't there previously. So that means that the, that the killer or killers likely came back to taunt the police. Right. And if you recall in this, in the first or second murder, several people heard by the guys who found the body. First murder. Well, the first one, and and there was stuff there that wasn't there previously. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, they they knew it was tampered. They had known the crime scene had been tampered. Right. So, so it's starting to look very similar to the first and second murder, and I don't know why. Two things: why wasn't the crime scene? And this will become really evident of why wasn't the crime scene secured and surveilled? Right. In just a minute. But yeah. Joe, what was this? Uh, I mean, you weren't around in 69, you know, but would they have, would the police have knowing that in previous crime scenes that, and it's probably known even back then that people come back to the site. I mean, that's how they catch the person who's going to, we're going to go into. The way I read it, I kind of heard that they were watching it. Then it was a kind of halfway watching it. And then when the next thing happened, I pretty much sure that nobody was watching. Right. And we haven't gotten there, but the Keystone Cop incident hadn't occurred yet, right? No, no. That would okay. okay, so Sheriff Harvey, well, this was in Washtenaw County, so this was Sheriff, Hardy, Sheriff Harvey's jurisdiction, okay? So uh, a couple of thing, bad things happened. And this uh, is one of them. And this is one of them. But So then a couple of nights later, uh, the uh, barn uh, burns to the ground. Right. And um, I guess that's an oopsie, oopsie doodle when the crime scene is burned to the ground. Except but, for this. They know who did it or they knew or specific it, and they said it was not connected with the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get to that. OK, so they they the uh, they wrote down license plates while the blaze was being put out. Mm-hmm. And they find out that um, the person who did it was an ex-EMU student who happened to be living in the apartment complex right across the street from Don Basin's house. Mm-hmm. And not only was it him, but it was him and a couple of buddies. Okay. Right. Which seems to be a reoccurring theme here in this. Man, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And, and so um, they bring this person in. And uh, he said that he was there the night before having sex with a woman, that he came back the, the, uh, the night before the murder. He was supposedly there with a woman. Uh, when he burns the place down a couple of, of nights later, he uh, was drinking bourbon and he got drunk and him and his buddies, they caught some hay on fire and burned the uh, crime scene uh, into cinder. I, I want to stop you there because any illusion... <laughs> that anybody was watching this place goes up in smoke with that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, right? Okay. The, uh, we were kind of wanting no, they were they were there partying, having sex, and burned down the place by mistake. Highly suspect. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it's moments like I watch a lot of this true crime stuff and 
I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm impressed with most of the people who are with no law enforcement. Um, experience, you know, they're not attorneys, they're not police officers, but they, they care and they do a lot of stuff. And I watch it and rarely do I think, OK, that guy's unprepared. Now, I've heard some silliness on it, but but I don't want to get lost on that because most of the people are doing a really good job. But I can tell because they don't have experience that sometimes this is before I started doing my own podcast and you and I had to fight this. Right. Right. Before you and I started doing a podcast, I used to go, you know, they speculate a lot and there's a lot of them. You know, junior profiler stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we started doing it. You know, I find is that you can't do it without doing some of that because some of it is so bizarre. It's like they burn down the most important crime scene you have. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, oh, well, he didn't mean to. You know, that, that, that's just crazy talk. OK, but they did burn down the crime scene. Yeah, one part of it. I mean, there was a, a farmhouse there, too, and she was. Parts of stuff was found in the basement of that. I'm not sure what got burned down exactly. Well, oh, I thought it was the barn, but uh, nothing should have been burned down. That, that's the answer. So the people shouldn't have been there partying. Well, interestingly, they're watching. They're taking once there's a blaze and there's a there's a. They must have responded with the uh, fire department, right? I would so, like to think that. Right. Um, but. Uh, just a few things to point out was uh, the drop site where the body was dropped was very close to uh, one of the others. Yes. And we'll we'll uh, put up the map of the, uh, the Detroit free press map of where all the bodies were found mm -hmm. that um, John Norman Collins was known to date a gal who was li living in that apartment complex uh, where actually the EMU student that burned the barn down lived. Um, that, and this is in Fournier's book, apparently Don Basom had hitchhiked around the Depot Hill uh, where uh, I think Skelton was uh, last seen and her friends were kind of beating her up saying, hey man, what do you know that there's a serial killer out there? She says, they're not looking for somebody like me. Right, right. Because if you had read the thing, she'd think I'm, I'm a kid. Yeah. She was wrong. Yeah. And I hate to say that, and that's a shame, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what we said in the last episode. We're like, why are women even hitchhiking at all during this, you know? And it's just the folly of you thinking, well, it's not going to be me. You know? Yeah, just that. Yeah. I don't fit the profile. Yeah. yeah, I don't, you know, and you're going to see more of that as we talk about these other people. I think another thing to point out now, starting with Mixer, going to Skelton, and now with Don Basin. This has all happened within what short period of time? About four weeks. Yeah. Um, you have to understand if you're picking up on this, you know, right now midstream, that Collins was going about once a year. If that's who you want to believe killed him. And, you know, you know my opinion because I just said it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm trying to be unbiased. Um, he was going and trying very hard to be a little bit more meticulous with the very first one. He was even trying to cut off hands and feet and stuff. Mm -hmm. To he's now three deep, if at least for the police, because in regards to what anybody tells you at this point, Mixer is part of the equation. And you can he and ha and talk about later and all this other stuff. But at this moment, she's part of the equation. You know. You know, and here's the deal and here's the problem. It is now escalating. And for those that, that watch the other ones just real quickly, um, Mixer murdered, no brutal sexual assault. Skelton, probably the most brutal of them all. And now Don Basim, and she is extremely brutalized. So it is ratcheted up, as they would say. Yeah. And she was strangled with an electric cord, and they tied the cord to the basement of the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. Um just a few odds and ends that I hadn't said yet. And that is uh, she was a very well-developed physically. 
she could bench press 70 pounds. And I don't know whether bench pressing 70 pounds is a lot, but I well, guess. she wasn't well for her size and her age. That's pretty stout. Right. And that, uh, that while her facial features were those of a 13 year old girl, her body made her appear four to five years older. That's what yeah. James wrote in his book. Um, that the victim walked, it's known that the victim walked down the basement steps at the deserted farmhouse about a mile north of her home. It's known that the victim was murdered at that location. The victim was then quite probably left there for six to seven hours, most likely around 3 a.m. Uh, until 3 a.m. And that's when they believe that the body was moved. Uh, and that was the Gale Road location. The uh, suspected vehicles, which we had said is Chevrolet, were damaged to the trunk, red, 63 Chevrolet. I'm not sure how they determined it was 63 Chevrolet. Um, and the other vol was an old Volkswagen Beetle which, we, Beetle, which we had mentioned. If you remember back to the Iowa State victim, mm -hmm. Sheila Collins, she was last seen getting into a light blue, dark blue Volkswagen Beetle. So... There seems to be a recurring theme. No, uh, there's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, I think if I could stop you now and just kind of, you know, go over the big one here of, of, of this, I can't get away from the fact that it now you got a car that looks just like the car that was involved in the second one. Yeah. Going back to the Iowa state thing, you had the beetle. You have, the ratcheting up of the intensity of all of this. And you're still going that for all practical purpose, and I want to stop everything and clarify this. John Collins is never convicted of anything other than the last murder. Okay. And we belabor the point that, that we do appear, believe that some DNA has been released. Um, you and I are actively trying to search people down that would know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, we're, as we speak, we're trying to get people to line up to interview and to talk to and help us. And it's not like we're just talking to talk and, you know, people may want to come along and help us. Anybody listening to this that knows anything, let us know. We've gotten some very good leads from here, but we're stuck with the fact that right now, again, you've got more than one person at the scene. You know, if you can believe that witness. You know, and again, I think this is one of those things where because nobody did. I understand you might have wanted to hold some back in case he got off. OK. I this is just and, and understand this. This is Monday morning quarterback. And everybody hates it, but sometimes you got to do it, especially in this setting. I really wish they would went to court with more than one case. I really do. Just for the clarification of it all. So, yeah, we, we, we don't have all the information that we'd like. So, you know, hopefully we can do it. There was a second map you sent me. Um, the second map I sent you, the first map was her walking path and the second one was the three different sites sites that you went there okay and all of those maps will be located i want to make sure that we get right. those out there um another kind of difficult thing that I, I want to kind of get to everybody and i just really kind of want your opinion on it is there's a video that's out there and there's several out there that have been that have talked about this but only one actually said what i kind of felt from the beginning was this is a game changer Mm -hmm. We've just spent a lot of time talking about things. But to me, this is a game changer. And I kind of want to explain to our listeners why I think that. Um, she's 13 years old. And I'm, you know, get away with all the speculating. She's 13 years old. She is not a co -ed. There is no indication that on this day at this time, she's looking for a ride. She is on a railroad track. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's 150 yards from her house. Right. I am going to speculate now because I think it's important too. I am sure that for every detective, because I believe a detective that was involved in this knew her and her family. Yeah. This had to escalate things 
tenfold. Not that the other stuff wasn't bad, but the other stuff you were kind of explaining away. Mm. And I hate to say it. I've read the books. They kind of, you know, you were looking for a ride and got to be careful not to victim blame. Mm. Okay. And we don't on this show, but there is a little bit of this overturn. They were doing this. They were doing it. This girl's walking down the railroad tracks. She's 13 years old. Right. Okay. And I can just imagine that that community exploded. So, and I'm pretty sure that one of the detectives did know her and her family. Yeah, I think he's the one that made the identification. So, you know, so I can imagine that this blew things open and made things more difficult. I think it's also good, and I think this is a moment to do this. And I hope this comes out right. Um, there is a point in this one, too, where I think you started getting a lot of people. And I'm talking about 1969. Yeah. Beginning to look deeply at this that were, were citizens or curious, curious people. Because there's the one, and we'll, we'll show a picture, where somebody had found a um, doll. Yeah, a baby doll hanging from a yeah. barbed wire and they, Yeah, and they actually had people chasing it that maybe that was symbolic. Now, it turned out not to be symbolic. There was also five uh, lilac flowers left in the driveway of the farm uh, found by, interestingly, a uh, reporter from, I believe it was the Detroit News, Detroit Free Press or Ypsilanti Press, I can't remember which, but it was highly suspect because this reporter is finding these, right. this fifth, fifth victim, so there's five lilacs, and this is another one where the crime scene Evidently, the cops come up on him and say, hey, what are you doing here? And he says, hey, I just found these five lilacs. Here. So right. I don't know whether he was aiming for a Pulitzer or. I don't know, but I know this. They were watching him carefully before yeah. and after that. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Just saying. That's what they right. said in the book. That's all I got to say about that. And the only I thing we know. hadn't really covered yet, and this one, um, this kind of will tip our hand as to where we think this goes, but it says the victim was not having her period at the time she was murdered. The smear from the vaginal vault indicated a presence of acid phosphate, which would tend to indicate the presence of seminal fluid, but no spermatozoa were found. Well, uh, Detective Schroeder in one of the videos I think we've had on another episode said that he interviewed after he had pulled all of the cold case DNA and ran mm -hmm. all the DNA. And he had mentioned this to John Norman Collins in an interview. And I don't know when the interview was, but, mm -hmm. um, and uh, didn't he say something that John Norman Collins started crying? And crying? Yeah. Yeah. So the DNA came back to John Norman Collins and uh, Schroeder evidently sprung it on him. And but we uh, can't uh, find anything that confirms that. No, we cannot find it, other than him saying it. Yeah, that's not confirmation. You know, we're just, I, the more you go down on this case, the more you realize there's more questions. But for our listeners, we're, we're not just sitting here complaining. We're trying to find some answers. There's yeah. still this whole uh, bloody car seat thing found yeah. at the like house that nobody can do any backup on. Right. So we're, we're, got, we're out there, man. We're out there trying to find it. Um, I think there's a precautionary tale here, too, for all the amateur um, sleuths out there, which I have nothing but respect for. I only use the amateur word because you're not getting paid. Okay. Um, some of them probably have the training that they have has really been their own effort and time, and I got to give them credit. And so I use amateur. I don't mean that as a slam. I mean, it's you're not getting paid. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're on to something when I watch these shows and I want to give them just a, a minute and then I want to encourage everybody else to kind of, you know, not just look at ours, but look at other people's. Most of these investigations, because of how we're getting them, I'm not saying, it, and again, we're trying to fill these holes, mm -hmm. but when you get them, there is a ton of holes. But even two people like you that have a lot more experience and we could sit there and go, blah, 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 you know, this and that. We actually sit at these meetings and go, you know, we kind of understand why you have to speculate a little more than you like. Yeah. You know, you have to understand why you have to profile a little bit more than you like. Yeah. 
But we all need to be careful that sometimes when we're doing that, that you don't go too far down the rabbit hole. You know, there's one case that I'm looking at where this guy has been, you know, he's a killer. He's a serial killer. He's a bad man. But, you know, they, they're trying to say he killed everybody. Mm-hmm. And he killed everybody in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s other than Kennedy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, we want to be careful with the speculation, but it, it's time that sometimes you, you're kind of stuck with that. But in this case, I want to point out sometimes the differences need to be focused on as much as the similarities. Okay. Mm-hmm. The, the differences need to be looked at as much as the similarities. Anything else you want to add on that, Mr. Baker? Only that, you know, Sheriff Harvey was involved in this one and he was mad because uh, they were trying to keep the site of the murder a secret. And evidently one of the officers let that slide to uh, the guy who found the five flowers. Yes. Harvey was actually right. Look, when they write about Harvey and I don't know, you know, maybe one day we can get with him or. It's it's uh, some things you have to be very gentle about, especially mm-hmm. this in this after so many years and stuff. But I'm mm-hmm. going to give Harvey some credit. He was actually right. They, there were things he was trying to do. I, I know that he is always portrayed as flamboyant. If you watch any videos of him, he is flamboyant. <laughs> right. Okay. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because they were losing control of the information game so quickly mm-hmm. that that information was getting out to everybody. And though you can sit there and go, well, that's, a, you know, how, how are the killing? Well, they were all in town. They all were intertwined. You can make an argument that everybody kind of knew everybody from some way, somehow, somewhere, even if they didn't know them, right. but they knew of each other. Mm-hmm. And Harvey was trying to keep control of it, but that just did not happen. As a matter of fact, with this one, I believe he was going to tell everybody to shut up about it. And basically they had already talked before he could even have the meeting. Yeah. And then also MSP started infringing on his jurisdiction too, because okay. they were doing the investigation of the fa- fire and they're the ones who found the guy who burned the place down. It wasn't Harvey's people, I believe. So yeah. Even though he says in, in a couple of videos, ah, bring them on. The MSP is welcome. Yeah. He didn't say that back in 69. 69. Uh, he did not say that. <laughs> right. so in hindsight. Right. But you're, you're fighting a lot of stuff. Look, I'm going to, I'm going to defend him for a second because there is a tendency to be talking about his flamboyancy. Look, I've read enough books, this guy, that's what they talk about. Right. He's trying to actually control the narrative of the information. He has to do an investigation. Mm-hmm. Your right to know does not supersede can, catching this guy. Now, later, we're going to talk about a situation that I wish he had never done that I can guarantee you he wish he had never done. Mm-hmm. We don't want to get too far ahead of that. And they brutalized him in the paper. Yeah. Okay. But he was trying to do something. But in this case, I don't think it's I don't think there's an argument to it. I, I mean, you know, he's he's trying to get a grip on this. Yeah. But the information is way out there. It's way out there. Way you can't reel it back in. You know, I've said it before, I probably said it 10 times during these videos. You know, we'll go. And then a hotline was set up to which yeah. citizens could give tips. To which 99.9% of them stink, yeah. are not involved in anything, and you waste a tremendous amount of time mm-hmm. chasing down leads that do not exist. Right. Okay. It's not a popular thing to say, but there you go. Yeah, that's the comment I wanted to make is we're still, um, so it's April, May, June, July, three months away from them setting up a task force. And there is, you know, this is the fifth victim. Um, And I believe it was in four different jurisdictions. So this is a problem, a major problem, probably even today. No, it would be. That would be. We talked about that on numerous occasions. For those that are not familiar with law enforcement, um, people don't always share their jurisdictions well. And I'm not going to get lost, but I could give you more. I could give you more. Just examples of that. And you can shake a stick at And everybody's trying to take care of their home field. And I'm not going to insult it, but it causes problems. 
but you know, we, I had questioned it before and maybe you can tell me, and maybe there is no answer is here. We have three potential perps in a red car again, and a, they're not back on John Norman Collins. If three I will more, never look, uh, this is something I got to say. I will never understand that. I can go back to the second murder. when he's <laughs> right, right. I will never understand. I will not understand why they didn't tie these cars together. I just, I don't, there's always, that's what I meant when I stopped and said, Hey, you wind up speculating because they just giant holes in the stories. Yeah. And we don't have, you know, there is a whole abundance of more information out there. We do not have the actual, our primary source material are three or four books that were written. People close to this or not close to it that have researched it. And the closest is Earl James because he was sergeant at the time. He mm-hmm. was he hadn't gotten there yet, but he's going to be put on the task force. Mm-hmm. And he is tasked with uh, drafting a whole bunch of documents for John Herman Collins for the trial that's coming up, you know, three or four months in 69 after this murder. So a lot of this may be hindsight. We don't know the timing of it. Yeah. Not to, so we're not beating up the cops. I mean, we are kind no, of. No, no, no. We're not, I, like I said, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you because I have this tendency to go this direction and you know it better than anybody, Robert. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you anytime I'm viewing anything, whether it's a film, talking about another case, now mm-hmm. the case, you show me a video. I said, look, I'm going to tell you what I know with having no reports in that. Right. See, because people will go, well, I believe my eyes. I know what I saw. I love you, brother. I believe my eyes, too. But you know what else I want? I want some reports. Yeah. I want to know what people said. I want to know what happened. Okay? Because your eyes are only telling you a brief part of the story. Even when your eyes, you're going to probably go, hey, after reading all the reports, I was right. Yeah. The one thing that I would say is, is, you know, a red car, this 1963 Chevrolet is probably a clue. I don't have any idea why that's not following. <laughs> that's what I meant. I have no reports, right? It could be evidence, right? It I would be. think that was a hint. That's why I'm always uncomfortable because, they, they, you know, you might find out one day some guy comes up and goes, listen here, you punks. We double check that. It's not true. And mm-hmm. I would say, okay, I didn't know. Right? Right. But it is a gigantic hole in this story. Yeah. I'll tell you the other gigantic hole in this story, and it, it, people die, is why after the second murder, they, didn't, they weren't on Collins like nobody's business. Yeah, and they seem to, we talked about it, and I don't think we said it here, but the polygraph was used prolifically to clear people back then. It was a different world. It was a different world. That polygraph, I've read, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny, but I mean, you can't believe how much stuff I've read since this, plus on other crimes, because I'm trying to figure out. I've read a lot about how people were investigating cases at this time, so I can get a grip on it. Yeah. Look, they were using, because I can't pronounce the scientific name, they were using true sir all, all the time. Mm-hmm. People were being hypnotized in this country. Yeah. Okay. And that lie detector test was like God. Okay. So different time, different era. And I've tried to get wrap my brain around it, but mm-hmm. extremely interesting. The one thing we didn't mention, I think you said it before in a couple episodes ago that the, the pressure on the police was ratcheting up. Oh, it's, it, it, I'm going to tell you something, Ben. I don't think that the average person who would think that maybe the police were just being silly about this or weren't taking it serious Mm -hmm. understand how much the pressure cooker was on now. She's 13 years old. I, I told you this since the day we did it. I consider this to be very different. I consider this to be an extreme situation where they probably were amazingly just under unbelievable pressure to try to figure this out. And they had lost the uh, faith or the, um, I don't know what adjective you use, use from the public at this point, because in, in the Michigan murder book and Fournier's book, they said that the, they weren't getting tips at all. People weren't were very closed mouth. I think they were disgusted with the way things were going. I will tell you this, the press was against them. And again, I've said it in before and I'll say it again. The press is not your PR relationship. Yeah. Okay. They're not. They're not here to do your job of making you look good. 
Okay, so I don't have any qualms with that, but the press was against them by now. Right. Um, for those of y'all that if you could do it, make sure you hit the subscribe button, leave comments. We have gotten some really good comments we have got there. We're building this program and we're hoping to do more with it. So any way you can support us with a like, subscribe, a comment, there's going to be a link down there if you'd like to give us a few dollars to help us out. We'd appreciate it. So we really are going to continue to build on this, but we're going to talk about BASIM again next week. There'll be a little follow-up on that. Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. I think uh, this is a what we're building here, and I don't know what episode we're on Oh, as far as this. What are we up to? 15, 14? 14. Right. I mean, this, is, there is no real definitive book on, on these murders, and right. we're tying in ones that really haven't been addressed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the Sheila Collins one, and then we're going to get into either the next one or the one after the California murder. Mm-hmm. And um, we're hoping that we're being as thorough as we can possibly be and as objective as we can possibly be. So it's a little different. We're not starting out with a preconceived, uh, though we're starting to narrow our, who we think the. the it's hard to miss some things, but. You know, there is, there is, but the. I, this is what I'm struggling with is how little there is out there on like um, Miss Skelton. I mean, that's unbelievable. For those that didn't watch the other two episodes, they just almost no. nothing on Skelton. Yeah. Even we, we couldn't even find pictures of her. No, we couldn't find a picture of her. Found that one picture from the Detroit Free Press. Right. That was it. It's, it's, it's crazy. And then, Don, there's a lot on her. Yeah. Why yeah. we're going to be able to have more pictures in the show. So. It's just one of those things where, yeah, it is, is just there. I, I will tell you this. I do not think at any time I would use the term that the police departments in this area lost control. I wouldn't say that. Mm-hmm. I will just tell you that there were many, many times where they lost control of the narrative. It's not the same thing. Okay. And once the press and everything kind of turned against them, I, I, I cannot imagine the pressure they were. And it's 1969. And they're rioting in the streets. They are. They are. So, so there you go. So we appreciate everybody looking, and we hope to see you again next week. But until then, see you. talk to you later.